That'd be a so motion to continue. continue. Seconded. Aye. All right. I really I fail Robert's rules. I really just make it all up. Um, anyway, uh, we're coming up. Let's see what time is it. It's five o'clock. We got. Uh, Man, I should know my schedule a little bit better. Uh, a couple more talks, uh, three more talks, I guess, uh, and then we'll have our keynote. And um, yeah, and then you all get to go do whatever you're gonna do in DC tonight. So uh, how exciting. I found coffee too, so I'm, I'm ramped back up again. Uh, anyway, Jeff Dodge is gonna talk about hacking cochlear implants. Uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, cochlear ear implants, implants are just like a miracle of modern technology, uh, right? I mean, they literally enable deaf people to hear. Uh, a friend of mine had a kid who couldn't hear. They put a CI in and the kid could hear at three years old. So I'm like, like, poof, like the world's a different place, right? They are amazing things. And Jeff's going to do abominations to them. Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but I'm really excited to hear his talk. So uh, this is uh, Jeff Dodge. Hello. Hey, this is my first time talking. It's actually my first time at ShmooCon at all. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about cochlear implants. I have a cochlear implant. I am currently in the process of reverse engineering the signal between the various components in them. Um, but first, I'm just going to talk about them a little bit try to explain how they work, what they do, and uh, I have a few other things too. All right, so I grew up with just a minor hearing loss. I didn't have a whole lot of hearing loss until I was about, until I, about the end of high school. I stopped being able to really talk or hear on the phone. And uh, after college, I really just couldn't communicate very well without lip reading. And I don't know if you know anything about lip reading, but it's actually notoriously unreliable. So anyway, I was just watching YouTube one day, and I was just browsing around. And I saw, I saw some people with cochlear implants just you know, having a conversation, which was something beyond me. Now, I had never really considered myself deaf, because when I was growing up, I didn't really fit in with either the hearing kids or the people who couldn't hear at all because I could hear some. So anyway, uh, here is a graph of some standard hearing losses. Uh, the top curve is actually a normal amount of hearing and the bottom curve is pretty close to what I have. And you can see that it pretty much just falls off a cliff at about 1,000 hertz. And at that level, you really can't hear any of the high-pitched sounds, like an S or an F or an H sound. And it makes it really hard to you know, hear. <laughs> anyway, so here's a picture of the actual implant and where it goes into the ear. If you see. You can kind of see the ear canal here, as well as the, the cochlear array down in the, uh, the curly part. Now, uh, here's a picture of the cochlea. And you can kind of see that around, around the base is where the high, the high frequency sounds kind of come in. And they're kind of quickly atten attenuated. And the lower frequency sounds kind of penetrate much further and deeper into the cochlea. Now, natural hearing has a, a nonlinear response, but for a cochlear implant, that doesn't really matter because the frequencies that they're concentrating on are kind of in the linear region. Now, actually, I have, uh, I have some graphs on the side here. You can kind of, you can kind of see what I was talking about before, but the, the point I missed, which was uh, part of the cochlea, part of the cochlea is the basal or membrane, and it actually, it actually resonates itself with low frequency sound. So that, that's, that's where your, your really low frequency sound perception comes from. Now, as far as cochlear implants in the United States go, 
There are three companies that provide cochlear implants. Um, you can read them here. There's a chart I have with the, uh, the various capabilities. I went with Advanced Bionics. Uh, I mean, I took one look at this chart and I kind of said, yeah, that's the one I'm going with. But uh, to be utterly honest, like the other implant device manufacturers, customers are also very happy with their implants. So I'm not sure how much of a difference it really makes. And to really compare, you'd have to have someone who had one implant and had it surgically removed and then replaced with a completely different implant, which is, as far as I know, there's only one person on the planet who's ever had that happen. Now, uh, there are a few different parts of the cochlear implant. There's an external part as well as the internal part. This picture here is the internal part. The external part is called the speech processor. And it handles microphone implant, audio processing, the signal generation over radio waves because there's no actual port or anything there. It's all RF. And it actually carries the power as well over a near field magnetic induction loop. And all of the pieces are extremely, are extremely expensive. I actually broke a cable today preparing and packing for the con, and it's going to cost me about $120 to replace it. <laughs> Here's a picture of the actual electrode array that goes into the cochlea. It's actually pretty difficult to find pictures in high resolution, so I apologize for the potato JPEG quality. And here, here's a, a picture of the, of the implant electronics with the case removed. You can see kind of a bunch of capacitors and an ASIC and a, and a DSP here and a few other things. Uh, as far as how implants work, what happens is the audio is kind of, is obviously processed, but what happens is first, the implant's dynamic range kind of truncates the signal, and anything under the low amount is just thrown away, and anything over the high volume amount is compressed to fit into the dynamic range. And then the whole thing is run through a gain control, and afterwards there are 16 bandfast filters Each of these bandfast filters are per electrode, and the whole signal is transformed with a fast Fourier transform. Then the highest intensity signals are converted into pulses and sent to the cochlea. All right, now here's the fun part. You know, obviously, the real question everybody wants to know is what does it sound like? And the answer is, it sounds a lot like normal hearing after you've gotten used to it. It doesn't sound perfect, but it's a lot better than I think a lot of people think it sounds. Like a lot of people seem to think it sounds like robotic voices, I guess, because of various YouTube simulations of the sound with a very low channel rate. Now, when I was first activated and had no idea what was going on, everything sounded like tones, like it was being modulated through a xylophone or some other strange musical instrument. Now, the frequency response is pretty low. It's about half of what normal hearing is, but it turns out that those really high frequency sounds don't really contribute a lot to speech. And the cochlear implant is designed mostly to allow the recipients to be able to communicate again. The Music was not really a big concern, and still they started advancing a little bit. And there are definitely limitations as far as uh, one of them goes. Is one of them is noise. Like at a con situation here, I get kind of a little overwhelmed when I'm in like. Hmm. So does everybody else? Yeah, I'm sure. Like, uh, but I just get like a giant mass of noise and
start to be able to like, like, like the signal to noise ratio goes way down. Oh great, more technical problems. <laughs> yeah. Is it good over there? All right. So now the signal generated by the implant is much different than what people are used to hearing. It is a series of pulses after all and it takes some time to get used to the sound. For some people it can take a really long time. It, I mean there's no, there's no real scientific data as far as I can tell but anecdotes seem to, sh seem to show that the earlier somebody has sound development and, and has experience with and the, the brain has experience with interpreting sound, they do much better at relearning how to understand the sound with a cochlear implant. Now, uh, for me, the very first day, uh, everything was just a mess of confusion. I kind of went, I went back to my home and I just started doing random things. Like uh, I made a bunch of sounds, like an animal was yelling. <laughs> You know, I, I was tapping things. I was listening to reverberations. Like, uh, I, I'm sure anybody would have thought I had just completely lost it. <laughs> like, I literally, I was just knocking, knocking on uh, windows and stuff. <laughs> it was crazy. Now, the day after that, I woke up and, you know, th things things were were much much more organized. I could I could start to get a sense of what I was hearing, and. I could tell that it was going to make a big difference. Now, I didn't, I didn't really get the same level of clarity that I have today until I started reading and researching the various programming options that the, the cochlear implants have. Now, I have a picture here of my personal map. You can see that there's a list of frequency bands here for each electrode, as well as the M level and the T level. The T level is the, the perception of the perception threshold level, which is the minimum level that I personally need to perceive a sound in that channel. And the M level is supposed to be the comfort level of a sound, so that sounds coming in aren't too loud. So it's basically the high, the high end. Uh, you can also see my channel rate is about 3,700 pulses a second, and that means each individual channel is receiving 3,700 pulses. Now, I, I have a bunch of slides here on simulation strategies, but I'm going to skip a little bit of it. My the sequence, uh, the strategy I use is high res F S with F120 was basically uses current steering. Now this slide shows that if instead of using just, instead of firing at just one channel, the, electric, the uh, implant can actually fire on two channels simultaneously and this allows it to kind of target areas in between them. And uh, F120 comes from obviously there are 15 separate pairs of electrodes and eight intensity values. Now, the reason I like the sequential version instead of the paired version is mostly there is a lot of noise in the paired version. If you look at these lists, like, okay, so what happens is each channel is pulsed in sequence with the sequential version and then in the paired version, you can kind of see that each half of the electrode kind of just goes. Now, uh, here's what I wanted to get to is uh, the reverse engineering portion. Now, uh, I I'm not an electrical engineer, so learning like all of these are all of this RF stuff and signals has been really interesting. And uh, obviously I cannot take it apart because I depend on it and it costs, you know, about $10,000 per processor. So the first thing I did was I went to Micro Center and I brought 
RTL SDR, to take a look at it. Now the RTL SDR was absolutely not good enough to actually get the signal data, but was good for confirming the carrier wave frequency. You can see a nice 3D, spec 3D frequency spectrum analyzer here. The, the RTL SDR produced when I was holding the antenna directly next to my head. And uh, I also have a water, waterfall diagram. You can kind of see at the very bottom, I knocked, I knocked the implant off to see what the waterfall would look like. And you can see it starts pulsing at the bottom. Now, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I got an oscilloscope. It was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I've used an oscilloscope before, but never owned one. <laughs> And the menus have menus, and there's just all sorts of options. Really, I had no idea what I was doing. So the one thing nobody ever told me about radio frequency is everything is an antenna. So to pick up the signal on the scope, all I did was just make a bunch of loops of wire and stuck them to my head. I mean, and you know, surprisingly, it worked. So I did a little, I look at the signal. It took me a little while to find it on the scope and to sync to it and trigger it properly. But once I found it, I looked at it and I looked at it again. And finally, I figured out, yeah, that's amplitude modulated square wave. Now, I, like I said, I'm not an electrical engineer, and I'm, I'm not great at, with analog, but I know Manchester when I see it. And as far as getting the data, I tried making an amplifier, but it didn't work out. So I just used the scope and pulled the data right off the scope. So I also managed to decode it and generate the actual bits coming out of it, and I know, I know you can't see it, I can't see it here. This is basically a giant array of bits. Uh, I, was try I was trying to get it to fit in here, and I just obviously did a very terrible job. <laughs> so what I did was I just, I made the bit, I made the text really small, and then I just started resizing the window, and eventually I got columns to line up, and I could tell that each of these each signal is comprised out of 12-bit words, and usually the packet size is 300. Sometimes it just sends shorter packets for whatever reason, but it's always 12-bit words. Now, about two days ago, I found a patent that covers the internal implant. And honestly, reading, it, reading patents is terrible, terrible. It's like the worst data sheet in the world. And uh, unfortunately, it pretty much just laid out the actual packet flow. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't implemented it into my decoding program yet, but it really took the fun out of cracking the link protocol, <laughs> which is, you know, like, like I'm not an expert in analog signals, but Cracking raw data is something I actually am all right at. <laughs> now, uh, there are some security problems here. There's absolutely no encryption because the implant was designed in 1998, back when they didn't care about these things. Now, fortunately, the antenna is all near field, so you can't really just have someone point a signal at my internal implant and override it because the transmitter is, you know, a quarter of the inch from my head. <laughs> and also, one really good thing is the implant doesn't seem to have any non-volatile RAM or firmware, so nobody can just, you know, wave the wrong thing around my head and brick my implant. That that would be bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, my friend actually asked me the other day. Uh, when we were talking about these security problems, if tinfoil did anything, so I tried it. I just put a piece of tinfoil over my head and then tried to put the implant on. 
And yeah, it, it totally didn't work. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of things to do in the future for this. Uh, I'd like to finish decoding the data, make, make my program actually interpret it all. You know, I'd, I'd also like to create a speech processor. And the patent did not describe the reverse telemetry system, which I, I'd really like to, you know, take a look at. Unfortunately, it's, it's a little difficult to see because the power for it is much, much slower than the actual implant forward link. So uh, that's it. I'd, l I'd like to close with, if anybody you know is starting to have hearing problems and is to the point where hearing aids no longer help them, you might want to consider telling them the implants are quite good at allowing them to communicate again. Like nobody ever told me this. Like I said, I had stumbled, it acro stumbled across it on YouTube. And like my, audi my audiologist never mentioned cochlear implants to me either. So that's it. Like, uh, You have a question?